Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome along to this webinar that we are hosting in conjunction with Revenue on the new professional e-professional withholding tax system. Um, myself, Nora Collander, and my colleague Maud Clear, we are effectively the tax team here in Chartered Accountants Ireland, and we'll be um, hosting this webinar here with you today. We're very fortunate to have senior revenue officials along with us to present on this new service. So we have Brian Farrell, Maura Keneally and Killian McCarthy. So what I'd say to you is uh, that we will be issuing the slides and we'll be issuing the recording of this session um, shortly after this presentation and what i'd ask you to do is put your questions in the q a box on your screen and please be as clear as you can so we can do justice to your questions which we will put to brian when he has gone through his presentation i would like to acknowledge that the new e professional service withholding tax system is a very much a welcome development. Chartered Accountants in uh, Ireland and the CCABI have been lobbying for this uh, innovation for a number of years. It is very progressive to have a system that we can now work at online and it takes 500,000 actual paper transactions out of the system and it will do away with that annual problem of poking around, rooting around, trying to find the uh, F45 on behalf of your client. So it's it's really is, is a great development. Uh, like all systems, it is new. It's going to have um, a bedding down period involved and it's also happening mid-year. So there, there could be teething issues uh, bringing it over and transitioning it onto the new uh, professional service, e-professional service withholding tax system. So as always, we need to have patience and work with revenue as, as they get through this, but ultimately it is to the benefit of taxpayers. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Brian Farrell. And Brian is going to share his uh, slides on the screen now. Hi, Brian. Folks, folks um, how are you? Um, my, my name is Brian Farrell um, uh, from the Revenue Commissioners, and uh, I'm the um, uh, business owner of various business tax systems um, uh, within um, Revenue, uh, and I'm uh, also the uh, team lead um, for um, uh, EPSWT, uh, uh, its implementation. And um, I suppose um, uh, the first thing I want to do is just thank uh, Nora and uh, Maud and Chris uh, uh, and the CAI uh, for the opportunity um, uh, to raise awareness of EPSWT. Um, so uh, to begin uh, with uh, my uh, presentation, uh, it's going to last about uh, 25 minutes or so, and uh, I want to devote the rest of my time uh, to uh, the Q&A. So please do uh, think of questions for me, and uh, we'll pick them up at the end. The um, uh, slides I'm going to talk about uh, are um, the legislation, a comparison of the paper process to uh, the electronic uh, version, um, payment notifications and uh, amending payment notifications, the um, F35 filing and how that's going to be approached. Uh, then I'm going to look at some uh, good advice and practice, um, the refunds and um, offsetting of credit withheld and agent access. And the system has gone live from the 1st of July. Actually, the system is live for about two weeks now. Um, so, legislation. Well, Section 13 of the Finance Act is, um, uh, has been signed now. Uh, and uh, the 1st of July, if you like, is the hard date for the introduction of electronic PSWT. This is now mean, I guess, in plain um, English, this means the ending of all F45 uh, forms issuing from account persons. And instead, there's going to be uh, a payment notification on ROS. Uh, 
Uh, the Finance Act also um, talks about two F35 returns for the 2021 um, period, uh, but more on that later. Now, otherwise, um, uh, the sections um, F21, I beg your pardon. There you go. Don't forget to turn off your phones. <laughs> um, the sections of um, F20 uh, to F29, 529, um, remain largely as is for uh, counter persons and specified persons. So the definition of the counter persons and specified persons remain as is. And there's no change to the definition of uh, what a professional service is. Um, uh, so uh, if uh, the service uh, was under the remit of the PSWT in the paper system, well, it remains so in the electronic system. Uh, a uh, comparison. Um, now, prior to the PSWT, when an accountable person which is typically a public service body, pays a specified person. 80% of the invoice amount is paid to the specified person and 20% is deducted and remitted to revenue. The specified person is then given an F45, which details that deducted amount. In uh, electronic uh, PSWT, you'll notice that the first two bullet points are exactly the same. So um, uh, the 20% is deducted from the invoice and remitted to revenue. Uh, however, instead, a payment notification is now made on loss. As Nora was saying, um, EPSWT uh, means that the council persons will not be submitting any paper forms to the specified person. This change will end the creation and transferring and minding of more than a half a million paper F45 forms annually. A significant reduction in admin burden on everyone. There are five aspects of functionality in the EPSWT system for the accountable persons, and I'm going to go through them. So um, one is uh, they can input payment notifications one at a time through the ROS interface. Two, they can upload bulk payment notifications via a CSV file up to 5,000 at a time. Uh, three is they can search and amend payment notifications. Four is they can generate a PDF acknowledgement of uh, selected payment notifications and the selection criteria are quite flexible. PDF acknowledgements should be given to the non-resident cohort of specified persons. So there's no need to give them to resident specified persons because resident specified persons can access their payment notifications online on either Ross or my account. The PDF acknowledgement contains the payment notification reference number, and this is crucial for the specified person when they're claiming their credit back. But again, more on that later. That fifth item is to generate a report of payment notifications. Uh, so this report uh, that they can generate, um, it's flexible in terms of um, uh, the period um, or the individual specified person, or a, a collection of specified persons. Uh, it's exportable to CSV file and therefore importable into Excel. And this will prove very useful when uh, the account of person is uh, making or determining their F30 and F35 returns. Uh, now, the specified persons for you. Uh, I'm going to swap between the slides a little. So um, uh, this is me going back and forth. And uh, I suppose the point of that is just to show that there's actually very little difference between the two. Uh, the only difference is the specified person cannot make or amend a payment notification. But 
all of the other functions um, are available to the specified person so they can search payment notifications. Uh, they can generate those PDF acknowledgements if they wish, and they can generate um, reports, again, under um, a very uh, flexible system of what they actually want to see in the CSV file that they export. And of course, importable into Excel. And from the specified person's point of view, this is useful when they're uh, making an interim refund claim. It will have all of the information on the report uh, and for claiming PSWT in their annual returns. Um, so, making a payment notification. In um, making a payment notification, uh, account holder persons have a choice of making a single payment notification through the ROS interface or by uploading a CSV file um, up to 5,000 payment notifications in a go. Details of the CSV file are um, on the revenue website. There's examples and uh, a guidance document. The first issue for a account holder person to determine uh, is, is my specified person a resident or a non-resident? Now, account holder persons do not need to determine the tax residency of their specified person. What they need to do and what they have always done is ask their specified person for their Irish tax re reference number. If they say they don't have one, well, then they should be considered non-resident for the purposes of EPSWT. There are three tax types that work in EPSWT. That's uh, income tax, corporation tax, and VAT. So the specified person must be registered for one of those to be considered a resident. Um, uh, if the uh, specified person is a resident, well, then the payment notification will contain name, address, tax type, tax reference number, payment, and payment date. And for uh, the non-resident payment notification, it will be slightly different. It's the name, address, country, foreign tax reference number, payment, and payment date, and phone or email. This slide um, contains far too much information, um, and so um, I won't leave it up for long, but what it contains is the columns in the CSV file of what to populate when your payment uh, notification refers to either a resident or a non-resident. So for example, the non-resident won't be containing a, a, a tax type or the uh, resident tax number, but further down, you'll see it will contain the um, non-resident tax reference number and non-resident country. Uh, you'll need to uh, include your own tax reference number on uh, the CSV file. I think it's cell uh, A2, um, off the top of my head. Uh, and the only other thing that I want to say while this slide is up is that uh, in in terms of system performance, I've been testing CSV files with up to uh, 5,000 payment notifications, and it's taking the system about two to three minutes to process uh, a CSV file of max size. So that's something to bear in mind when you're uploading CSV files. When an error is discovered in a payment notification, uh, the account of person can self-correct the record with EPSWT. This is introducing a new, I guess, flexibility to PSWT. The account of person can amend uh, an existing uh, payment notification, or they can add another payment notification, or they can delete a payment notification, uh, even uh, for a period where they have submitted the F30 monthly return. And now there are rules to amend the, excuse me, I beg your pardon. And the um, uh, rules are, uh, first, you have to amend one at a time through the ROS interface. 
So there are no CSV bulk amending options. You uh, can uh, only amend the period where the F35 annual return has not yet been filed. So the F35 is considered the final reconciliation, and after it's filed, the self-correction options are closed. And you can still amend after that, but you'll need to contact revenue. If you amend the payment notification, which causes the payment uh, to uh, increase, you will need to adjust your next F30 liability. And similarly, if you decrease the payment, or let's say delete it, well then you will need to reduce your next F30 liability accordingly. And um, that last bullet point um, on the slide, some PNs will not uh, be amendable. Now, uh, what I mean by that is that um, certain PNs uh, won't be available to uh, be amended, even if the F35 has not been filed. And um, this is because uh, the specified person will have already claimed the credit in an interim refund. Now, um, if you try and amend uh, one of these uh, payment notifications, um, you'll be advised to contact revenue. So you create a my inquiry outline the scenario. And um, revenue will examine this and then uh, correct the record of the specified person and then mark the um, payment notification as being amendable again. And then the account person can go and amend the payment notification. So um, it's a slightly longer route uh, you just need the contact revenue to resolve it. Yes, so uh, EEPSWT is being introduced mid-year um, uh, from the 1st of July, uh, and this necessitates two separate F35 returns. Uh, the first return is for the period the 1st of January um, to the 30th of June, and this return must be filed prior to the 23rd of August. This return is similar to all previous F35 returns um, uh, in that it must be filed with an associated schedule of payments. The second return uh, is for the period the 1st of July to the 31st of uh, December, and this return must be filed uh, prior to the 23rd of February 2022, which is the standard filing date for the uh, F35 return. Unlike all uh, previous F35 returns, this return does not require a schedule of payments. And in fact, all subsequent F35 returns will not require the schedule of payments. Again, this is an uh, admin burden reduction to the PSWT process. At the last point, um, I would count persons who are obligated to file the Section 9, sorry, 891B. Um, uh, they would often have a derogation not to file the schedule of payments with their F35. That derogation does not apply to the first return in 21. So they will have to uh, um, submit the first return with a schedule of payments. So, some good practice tips. Um, well, the uh, bulk of administration in EEPSWT is done by account persons. So, um, in preparing for EEPSWT, um, account persons should be uh, aware that they have uh, the correct and relevant information um, uh, on their specified persons. So, there are three. Um, uh, I suppose, tokens, effectively. Uh, that is the um, tax reference number, the tax type, and the name and address. Now, I want to talk, I suppose, a little bit about the tax type. Um, uh, the tax type is a field that hasn't occurred on the F45, but it exists in the payment notification in EPSWT. 
And um, the first thing that I would say is that if you have previously known your uh, Swiss watch person by their VAT number and nothing has changed, well, then that's how you can identify them in the PSWT system when making a PM. So uh, you would put in their um, uh, VAT number that you would see on their invoice and choose uh, VAT as their tax type. Um, a typical SP customer um, or specified person, um, I beg your pardon for the acronyms, um, uh, would be registered with uh, four numbers. So that would be um, like the PPSN, uh, income tax uh, or corporation tax, BAT, and commonly uh, capital gains. Now, uh, for most um, that's what persons, these are all the same number, but not always. And uh, these exceptions are the reason why revenue needs the tax reference number and the tax type within the electronic system. A um, specified um, person must be registered uh, for either IT or CT or VAT. Um, and the uh, rule of thumb um, when uh, a specified person has provided you with their tax reference number is um, uh, when you want to decide what their tax type is, is that uh, if your specified person is a company, you use a uh, corporation tax, otherwise you use income. So uh, the specified person, uh, it'll be obvious that they are a company. They will have um, unlimited, or limited, or company in the name, and then you use um, CT as their tax type. Uh, otherwise, it will be IT. Now, um, uh, the um, other uh, points um, that I'm um, raising there are... Um, uh, payments to uh, specified persons rely on correct BIC and IBAN information. So uh, the scenario would be that the payment run is made on a given day and a bank file is created. And then um, the file is sent to the bank. And then uh, the payment notifications are made on ROS. Now, um, uh, it usually takes a number of days for the bank to come back to say that there was an error with whatever amount of uh, payments uh, that did not go through. Uh, and then uh, the account of person needs to contact the specified person um, who maybe, you know, take a long time in determining what their actual BIC and IBAN is. And this involves uh, amendments to payment notifications. So I suppose the point is that um, if uh, the accountable person uh, is sure that they have the correct BIC and IBAN, it certainly makes for a smoother um, change from the paper system to the electronic system. The um, uh, next two um, uh, bullet points um, are uh, some uh, interesting, I suppose, teething issues that we came across. Um, and they're mentioned on another uh, slide. But uh, while they're here, I'm going to talk about them. Um, Non-accessible spouse um, registration issues. Um, a phenomenon, uh, I suppose, we've come across is that uh, it's occurring particularly in the medical profession, but I think all of the professional sectors um, are affected by it to some extent, and that is um, that uh, doctors are marrying doctors and um, solicitors are marrying solicitors, for example. Uh, now, uh, the um, scenario being that both spouses are specified persons, the um, Accessible spouse uh, will be registered for income tax. Um, they'll be returning the Form 11 for both spouses. Uh, the correct registration for the non-accessible spouse is that they are registered for income tax and seized. Uh, 
However, what we have found is that many are incorrectly registered for PAY. And a PAY registration will not get them into the EPSWT system. So if you remember, there's three possible registrations, income tax, corporation tax, and VAT. And a ceased registration will work. So um, prior to the 1st of July, we have um, uh, both registered and ceased uh, 1,400 um, uh, non-accessible spouses, which we've found. Uh, and um, we have also manually registered um, about 150, which were identified to us by various accountable persons. Um, so uh, it's just something to note. There are likely to be more out there. Now, hopefully the work that we've done in relation to fixing it has mitigated the problem significantly, um, but it may um, be out there still. And the last bullet point, um, old uh, VAT numbers um, work fine. Um, now it is possible to convert to um, a new uh, style number, uh, which is similar to the PPS uh, um, format. Um, now, if you do that, um, then it won't, the system will not um, recognize the conversion. So if the specified person has an old style VAT number, well then the correct way to identify them is using the old style number, not the conversion to the new style. Uh, this slide is um, uh, got, um, I suppose, the uh, teething problems that we've noticed. Um, the um, so I'm going to go through these. Um, uh, accountable persons um, having two tax records needing consolidation. So um, now we've come across um, uh, three accountable persons um, dropped into us. Well, there may be more out there, but uh, an accountable person has one tax record where their PSWT um, registration lies, and then they have another tax record uh, where almost all of their other tax registrations lie. Uh, so when they go into Ross, what they find is Ross thinks that they are a specified person, and they don't have the option to make payment notifications, and that's because their um, uh, PSWT registration exists on another tax record. So that uh, occurred uh, three times so far. Um, a number on the CSV file is the number associated with the DigiCert. So um, uh, many are putting in uh, the uh, PSWT number into the CSV file. And if um, your um, main number associated with the DigiCert is different, uh, the PSWT system will um, object and it will invite you to put on the correct number, in which case you should just do that. Um, now, um, seven accountable persons have asked us to change their PSWT number so as it's the same number and their tax record is aligned. So that's just another issue we've come across. Um, you know, as to why a uh, payment notification would fail, well, um, it could be that the um, specified person has provided the incorrect number or that the account person has recorded the number incorrectly. And um, those first two issues will need to be resolved um, before we come to the third, which is a registration problem. Um, and uh, revenue can help um, with the uh, registration issue. So I've mentioned the non-accessible um, spouse problem and the old style VAT numbers, um, but other um, issues that um, I've seen coming in is where um, the tax reference number is for a charity or it's a T number, which is um, given to non-residents. So in which case you shouldn't be putting in any uh, tax reference number uh, because they are a non-resident. And finally, uh, there is a W number. 
now for W numbers, um, uh, the uh, specified person will need to get a valid PPSN from uh, social welfare, and then they'll need to be registered for income tax. That's the resolution for those cases. So some more good practice for accountable persons. Um, uh, the paper forms um, will um, can be returned uh, from the 23rd of August. Well, that's the F45s. The F43s, however, um, uh, shouldn't be returned until the 30th of November. That's 2022 next year. Um, the F43 are used to amend an F45 or to replace them when uh, the F45 is lost by the first right person. So um, there'll need to be um, a long period for F43 forms to be around to make sure we have flushed out all of the F45s from the system and uh, the end of November next year uh, should resolve that. Uh, one of the questions that we get asked is um, how long after a payment should a payment notification be made? And um, the legislation says um, that the accountable person on making a relevant payment shall submit to the revenue commissioners a notification. Now, revenue's interpretation of this is that the payment notification should be uh, part of or immediately after the payment roll. And we have also accommodated a seventh day future date in the system, uh, and that's because a number of accountable persons, um, they make a um, payment run and then they create their bank file, and then uh, the dates in their uh, payment run are um, future-proofed, uh, by the time the bank gets the file and acts on it. So that's to account for that. Uh, we have also been um, uh, providing an opportunity for account persons to test CSV files. So the way to do that is to send in your CSV file, um, uh, making, let's say, a sample payment to every one of your specified persons. We will test it. The results and to date, um, I think uh, 79 council persons um, have availed of that service, and we've picked up um, all of the significant players within that group. So, interim refunds, um, uh, well, under certain uh, conditions, specified persons can claim interim refunds. Those uh, conditions being that the amount of PSWT that they have suffered um, equals the tax paid last year. Um, and uh, the way it was done in um, the paper system was that they would complete um, F50. And then with the F50, they would submit all of the F45 forms issued within that period. And revenue would examine them to make sure that they were valid and, and uh, do some sums in relation to um, all, all of the values on the forms and versus last year's um, tax returns. Uh, and it would be processed. Now, with electronic PSWT, uh, the process is that the specified person would complete a different claim form. Uh, we're calling it the F50A, uh, and it has a field for the payment notification reference number. And um, the specified person would enter all of the payment notification reference numbers that relate to the period of claim on the form. And that's it. So there's no need to submit anything else. There's no need to submit the uh, acknowledgements um, uh, not for residents, which represents the majority of specified persons. Non-residents will be claiming in the same way that they always have to the International Claims Unit in, N in NINA. And they have um, a slightly adjusted IC11 form, which notes uh, the payment notification 
um, and um, uh, other than that, um, their system of claiming the credit out will remain the same. So, uh, well, I think I've skipped one, uh, agent um, access. So agents have full access to the EEPSWT uh, system um, uh, where they are linked um, in a certain way. So for accountable kind of persons, they have to be linked um, to the PSWT tax registration, and then they will have access to everything, making and amending payment notifications, creating those uh, acknowledgements and running reports. Uh, and for specified persons, um, a link to any tax registration will do, and you'll be able to extract the um, uh, reports and the acknowledgement in search. So this is my uh, final slide. Um, so um, uh, I just note on it um, that um, the uh, Tax and Duty Manual on EPSWT uh, was published um, just over two weeks ago, well, I'd say republished, um, with um, all of the latest information on EPSWT. So uh, that's on the Revenue website. While the slide is there and I have the floor, what I'm going to do is um, mention um, two items that we are looking at to enhance the system already. Uh, one is um, to add an additional field to the CSV file uh, where the account person can enter their own free tax information if they wish. So uh, they can enter, for example, a, a unique supplier number that makes sense to them. So uh, when they extract the data from the EEPSWT system, they will have a unique number which will make it easy to uh, cross-reference that information into their own financial software. The second um, uh, one that we're looking at is uh, to give the administrator, uh, a cert owner or the cert owner, the rights to control access for subserts. At the moment, all subserts have access to EPSWT system. However, some administrative users may want to restrict that, so we want to provide that to um, the um, user. Uh, there's, a, there's a third one, actually, um, which I'll mention briefly, and that is um, uh, there was a, a, a minimum um, payment of one euro in the CSV file for a payment, and some account persons uh, want to make payments notifications to their specified persons for values less than one euro. This was coming up because they um, were obligated to make payments uh, of interest uh, because of late payments. Uh, and that interest is often very low. Uh, so we're looking to reduce the threshold in the CSV file to below one euro. Um, in the interim, you can make a uh, payment notification singly for um, uh, a very low figure, well below one euro, so you can get around it that way until we fix the uh, threshold in, in the CSV file. And um, uh, I think I'm going to stop talking and um, just uh, thank everybody, and I, I'm going to see if there's any questions. Yes, Brian, thank you very much. We have a few in here already. Um, the first one is, can you tell us if the specified person will automatically see a pre-populated credit for the tax withheld by the accountable person on their Form 11? Uh, yes. Um, uh, the, well, <clears throat> let me see them. Not on the Form 11. Um, so the specified person will automatically um, see the payment notifications. Um, uh, when they go into Ross or my account, um, uh, and uh, they can extract that information um, uh, into uh, a file that they can import into Excel, uh, it will not be pre-populated onto their Form 11 right now. Um, but um, it um, uh, is something that we have in mind uh, to do uh, for next year. This um, uh, year, 
uh, represents, if you like, half a year of EPSWT. So uh, we cannot uh, populate half uh, the information and then we have the other half, which is in the paper system. So when we have a full year of EPSWT, uh, we are planning on uh, populating it on the formal level. So one to expect for next year. Yes. Great. Uh, a number of complications seem to be out there in relation to the HSE as an accountable person. Um, an example that we've come across is that an employee doctor may be listed as the specified person, but the GP practice is the chargeable person for tax purposes. Um, how will the GP practice get the credit for the tax allocated to the employee doctor? Yes. Um, uh, now, um, Revenue um, has um, examined um, uh, this uh, a little. Now, uh, <coughs> this relates to um, the GMS contract that the HSE has with their various um, doctors and consultants. Now, I have seen the um, GMS contracts, but... Um, my understanding, and I'm open to correction, uh, is uh, that the GMS contract is with the doctor, uh, the doctor as an individual, not the doctor as a practice. Um, so that means that the uh, payment um, uh, is uh, to the doctor. Uh, the payment notification in the EPSWT system should be to uh, the doctor. And um, it has um, tax ramifications for the doctor who may be now both um, receiving um, chargeable income and PAY income um, from his work within that practice. So the uh, payment notification um, uh, will appear on the doctor's record, not on the practice's record. I hope that answers your question. I think it does, and it would be revenues. There'd be no facility whereby the credit could be transferred to the GP. To the GP's practice. Um, yeah. Uh, I suppose the short answer would be no. Um, uh, it crosses all sorts of data protection lines, but um, I think it's... Um, uh, uh, would also um, trigger a taxable effect uh, if uh, you were transferring um, a payment from one entity to another. Uh, so. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next question here. Um, is there a new agent link required to be submitted for all our clients on our agent Rod's team? Um, a if uh, you are an agent for uh, an accountable person, you have to make sure that you are linked to their PSWT registration. Uh, if your client is a specified person, um, you'll have full access to the EPSWT system already. Uh, so by all means, you can go and have a look at it. And leading on from that, will the specified person receive an electronic notification? Will you give me that again? Um, um, will, will the specified person receive an electronic notification? Uh, about the linking? About the payment notification? Absolutely. Um, uh, so um, if um, the accountable person makes a payment notification, um, uh, the specified person will be informed of that um, something has occurred in Ross and that they should go in and, and have a look at it. And it's done in real time. Now, the same goes for if the accountable person uh, amends or deletes a payment notification. And the specified person will be notified that something has occurred and they can go in and check their um, EPSWT system. And in real time, they will be able to see what has occurred. Very good. Um, our next question, does a specified person, uh, an individual as opposed to a company, have to be registered for income tax 
for the accountable person to be able to submit a payment notification for them? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but a ceased registration will do. Um, so um, this was uh, cropped up for us, um, uh, for example, around non-accessible spouses um, uh, because um, they um, will not be or ought not to be um, uh, coming under any uh, compliance um, projects for not filing a Form 11, for example, um, because their accessible spouse is filing the Form 11 on their behalf. So uh, a specified person who is an individual will have to be registered for either income tax or VAT, and if they're not passing the VAT threshold, well then an income tax is appropriate. Um, but it may be a case of being registered for income tax and ceased if they are a non-accessible spouse. Okay, and then our next question um, is, what are the conditions under which the specified person can claim an interim refund? Okay, so <coughs> um, you can claim an interim uh, refund uh, when uh, the specified person has suffered sufficient um, withholding that it equals last year's tax liability. Any subsequent um, uh, PSWT suffered can then be claimed in an interim refund. So um, uh, you do that by uh, submitting an F50A under the new system. Um, if your uh, claim crosses the period of the paper system and the electronic system, you will need to submit two claims. Uh, that's an F50 for the period of the paper system with the uh, F45 forms, and then a F50A for the period for the electronic form, uh, and that F50A will contain the payment notification reference numbers. Very good. Our next question then is, where can we find the test file area on ROS? Um, okay, so um, there's um, not exactly a test file area on ROS. If you um, want to submit a, a CSV test file, the way to do it is through my inquiries. Um, uh, there is a specific category in there under the PSWT tax set, uh, so you select PSWT and then more specifically, and you will see the option to select the CSV test file. Um, and uh, yep, if you send that in there, I'll pick it up and test your file. Okay, great. And then we have another question on what happens where there is a partnership with payments to all partners of specified persons, but the withholding tax deducted from particular partners is not consistent with their profit share. Is there a facility to transfer tax between the partners? Okay, let me see if I can get this. So uh, the withholding tax deducted uh, from particular partners is not consistent with their profit share. I'm trying to picture it. Um, and there's not a, a facility um, within EPSWT to uh, transfer um, uh, withholding tax uh, within EPSWT. Um, so um, if uh, there is an adjustment to be made, uh, you'll have to um, contact revenue and that adjustment will have to be made from the tax records of the individual partners. The um, EPSWT system certainly does not allow a self-correction along those lines. Work through the questions here to see if there's any anything further. Um, there is a bit of discussion in the chat in relation to GMS contracts. Um, yeah. If you can see it there. And there's reference to chapter or chapter one, part eighteen of the TCA, providing clarity on the apportionment of PSD PSWT within partnerships. Uh, okay, and can you run that by me again, Maud? So 
a clarification on the point in relation to the GMS contracts. Um, there is a question that includes chapter one, part 18 of the TCA that provides clarity on the app apportionment of PSWT within partnerships. And then there is another question on the same topic in the Q&A and the questions earlier regarding employees in the GP practice receiving payments from the HSE that are income of, of the practice and therefore withholding tax is a credit for the practice. Uh, the question earlier regarding employees in a GP practice receiving payments from HSC that are income of the practice and therefore the withholding tax is a credit for the practice. This matter uh, that will uh, need resolution for many practices. And the question comes down to who the, um, is named on the contract. Um, and if the um, uh, person um, on the contract is named as the individual doctor, well, then that is the doctor who is um, receiving the relevant payment on your PSWT. Um, okay, I suspect that will be one that we'll need to take away. Um, so I suppose with that, we might bring the webinar to a close. A big thank you to you, Brian, for your presentation and to all your colleagues in Revenue for joining us today. And thank you to Chris for organising uh, the webinar and to the CPD team here in Chartered Accountants. And many thank you to you all who joined us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.